Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I hope you're having a wonderful week. My week has been eventful. I will say that. It's only Tuesday. It's been eventful. Um, Eventful in some good ways, eventful in some crazy ways, but definitely uh, eventful and uh, too much to go into right now. So just use your imagination, make up a good story. (laughs) Yeah, pretend it's pretend I, I said it um at any rate uh, beyond my eventful week we have another author interview another great author join me on the podcast this week I am joined by author Kyla Pannon to talk about her book uh Stalking Shadows it is a dark retelling of the Beauty and the Beast story let me go ahead and give you the description from the book Marie would do anything to protect her sister and keep their family's secret. 17-year-old Marie mixes perfumes to sell on market day in her small 18th century French town to save for a dowry for her sister, Ama. But her perfumes are more sweet, more than sweet scents in cheap cut glass bottles. A certain few are laced with death. Marie laces the perfume delicately, not with poison, but with a hint of honeysuckle that she's trained her sister to respond to. Marie marks her victim, and Ama attacks, but she doesn't attack as a girl, she kills as a beast. Marking Ama's victims controls the damage and helps keep the suspension the suspicion excuse me at bay. But when a young, unmarked boy turns up dead one morning, Marie is forced to acknowledge she might be losing control of Ama, and if she can't control her, she'll have to cure her. She knows the only place she'll find the cure is in the mansion where Ama was cursed in the first place, the home of Lord Sebastian Leclerc. But once she gets into the mansion, she discovers dark secrets hidden away. Secrets of the curse, of Lord Sebastian, and of herself. And again, that is the description of Stalking Shadows by Kyla Pannon. And it is, again, a a retelling, as you probably gathered, of Beauty and the Beast. Definitely definitely not your Disney version of this story, but um, I enjoy that it's, um, yeah, it's not just your, your straightforward, there's a young woman and she meets this beast, et cetera, et cetera. We've got some role reversal. We've got some things going on. Uh, we've got sibling dynamics um, and lots of different different layers in this story. So um, Marie has a younger sister, Ama. Sebastian has a younger brother who is, has health issues, Um Sebastian's parents are dead. Marie and Amma's mother is dead. So there's um, a lot of family relationships and family trauma that uh, has happened before the book starts. And then, of course, Amma has been cursed. She turns into a a beast, uh, um, a werewolf, what have you, once a month. And she's 15. So, oh my gosh, 15 is hard enough, right? (laughs) Without being cursed and turning into a werewolf once a month and then killing people. I mean, awkward. So lots of lots of different um, different levels, and so let's go ahead and turn to the interview with Kyla, and she can tell you more about the book and why she chose to retell this particular fairy tale, etc. And again, the book is called Stalking Shadows. Hi, Kyla. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am happy to have you here. We're going to talk about your new book, Stalking Shadows. Before we do that, though, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, that would be very nice. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I'm an author. I focus mostly on um, YA fantasy, but I also have been trying um, 
just trying out writing in middle grade and adult as well. Um, I'm a mom, I'm from Canada, um, I'm a, a huge reader, and just, you know, I love to consume any kind of historical fantasy media, so yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask you a question that I don't always ask, but uh, can you give me any background on your first name? Because I'm fascinated with names and why people, <laughs> why, why parents name their children certain names. So uh, if, if you're comfortable, can you share that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, I was born in the late 80s. So it was kind of the time of the Ashleys. And my mom wanted to name me Ashley, but there were three other babies I guess who were born in the hospital at the same time with that name so she um decided she didn't want me to be like Ashley D that's my maiden name um and she liked Kyla because they liked Kyle for a boy but she thought it looked softer with the C and I, I just don't know if she understood <laughs> I don't know if she really thought about the rules of phonics when she was choosing it uh, so all my life I've gotten Sila, Cecilia, Kayla, just some, some variations, but it is uh, pronounced with a hard C, so kind of, yeah. Well, I like it because it's different, but yeah, I can understand that you probably have never had it pronounced correctly on the first try. <laughs> no, most of the years, I always knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and you've probably never found anything with your name on it, you know, like you could. No, the bane of my existence <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s because you would I would find stuff with the Kyla with the K and my mom was like oh nope, that's not your name you can't have it <laughs> like, oh, never gonna have anything never gonna have the pencil with my name on it you should have just started buying things with Ashley on them you would have found <laughs> yeah, that's true I would have found lots of those in <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, um, the book is called Stalking Shadows. Would you give mm-hmm. an overview of the story? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the elevator pitch. So Stalking Shadows is a feminist gothic retelling of Beauty and the Beast, uh, where Marie must select her sister's victims to protect her. But when the t- child turns up dead, she's forced to break the curse or face who's really become a monster. Yeah. And it is, it's a, it's a retelling. Um, and can you give your, ins- uh, start with your inspiration for the story? Yeah, for sure. Um, my inspiration actually came from falling down a Wikipedia rabbit hole, uh, one night. So, I mean, I've, I've always loved Beauty and the Beast. It's one of my favorite Disney movies. I've also always been really interested in the original versions of fairy tales, um, and studied them a bit in university. So, uh, just it's always been one of my favorite stories and then I was looking online one day and I, I don't remember how I kind of stumbled across it but I found some information on the Beast of Gévaudan which was like this real kind of historical mystery uh, in 18th century France um, there is this beast I guess I still don't really know what it is that was terrorizing the Gévaudan Valley and, and killing many people mostly women and children um, the king even sent down his uh, like his soldiers to come and try to kill it and get rid of it. And I thought they did. And then it came back and there were various reports of it looking uh, sort of human like. And, you know, obviously werewolf comes to mind for a lot of people um, when reading this story. But the, the truth is, is that we still don't totally know what it is. Most people described it as bigger than a wolf and it didn't really act like a wolf. Uh, so my favorite uh the theory on it is that it was a female lion escaped from the Royal Menagerie. So I think that's pretty cool, but yeah, so I, I started kind of looking into the story and just reading everything I could. Cause I thought it was so interesting. I love something where we still don't really know what happened <laughs> where it's not tied up in this like neat bow. And uh, I just kind of started to imagine um, the young women not necessarily being killed by the beast as they were unfortunately in uh, in real life but as a young woman being the beast and it reminded me of um, Beauty and the Beast and I, I they were written or Beauty and the Beast was written somewhat in the same time frame although it was uh, before this happened so I at first I wondered if this is perhaps inspired the original Beauty and the Beast but unfortunately that doesn't seem to be the case but I still thought there were some some cool parallels there. And, and from a, a mystery standpoint, you know, it, it can be frustrating when something doesn't have an explanation, but from um, an author standpoint, I would imagine that that really gives you some freedom to play around <laughs> with the story because you don't, you don't have to, you know, stick to what was actually concluded. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It just, it leaves a lot to the imagination. And uh, I, I kind of love, not to say that I believe in werewolves in real life, but I kind of love that there's an open-endedness to that. And it's like, mm, what was it really? And yeah, there's just lots to play with there. So for me, it was, it was great. Speech. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in your acknowledge, acknowledgements that you, um, you wrote the very first line, which has never changed. So mm -hmm. can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I was on sub or no, I was querying my, my first manuscript at the time. And, uh, and I knew I wanted to start on something new. And so this kind of sparked the idea of the story. And my first step in my process for writing any manuscript is sitting down and writing like a discovery page. So just, you know, the jumping into the story where I'm trying to feel the main character's voice and get a sense of the world and tone. And I do that before I do any uh, formal planning. So that was a, the first line was a result of that, where I just sat down and, and imagined them in their cottage making, you know, these perfumes and um, yeah, it's just, it's stuck. All right. Now that you know a little bit more about the premise of the book, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, Kyla will be talking a little bit more about Marie as the main character, so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking this week with author Kyla Pannon about her book, Stalking Shadows. Let's return to the interview. And can you talk a little bit um, about Marie, who's the main character? Um, talk about what you think about her as the main character might resonate with readers. I, I hope that uh, the moral ambiguity will will resonate with readers. I, I don't think anyone's perfect, <laughs> not <laughs> maybe not um, as far into the gray area as Marie, but I think just struggling with not knowing exactly how to protect your family and what's the best thing for them and how to make the best choice. I think that's something that we all experience in day-to-day -day life. So I hope that resonates. Um, I also gave her an anxiety disorder, which I also have. And so I, I hope that readers can see that and, and it resonates with them in, in terms of um, just seeing a character who kind of goes through some of the same things they do. Um, yeah, so those are the, the main two things about her that I, I think uh, and hope readers take away from her. And I think her relationship with her sister really forms uh, the basis of a lot of what we see in, in the book, even though mm -hmm. from the first page, uh, she changes a lot. She goes through a lot of um, different experiences, but her relationship with her sister, like for me personally, she's much more likable than her sister from the, from the start. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she's morally gray, but she's the more sympathetic character also. Mm -hmm. um, and can you talk a little bit about the relationships in the book between her and um, her sister, between her and Sebastian, just kind of how those help further the story? Mm -hmm, for sure. So um, it's funny because I don't have a sister, but I have two younger brothers. So I think I wrote Marie from that place of being the oldest sibling and having to be responsible for the younger siblings who maybe don't, uh, you know, see the, the impacts of what they're doing on their lives and the rest of the world and just are kind of going through pretty carefree. And then the oldest is um, kind of left to clean up the messes, which I'm not saying is reflective of my actual 
actual brothers in case they listen to this, but uh, I'm going to tell your brother. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I was an older sister to a, um, a much younger brother, uh, one of my brothers, 10 years younger. So there's definitely that caretaker relationship. And even though the age gap is in this big between Marie and Emma, I feel like Marie definitely has stepped into that role in the absence of a responsible parent. Um, so she feels, I think she's just over her head and she loves, but she still loves Emma no matter what she does. Uh, there is no breaking that bond. And, and I think a lot of that bond comes from having grown up in a, a fairly traumatic household where they've lost their mom and their dad is an alcoholic. And I, I think that um, living through those kinds of things together and having to lean on each other uh, really builds that that kind of strong bond where even though Marie doesn't agree with everything Emma's doing, uh, she's still trying her best to take care of her and, and just do, you know, the best thing that she can for them within the world that she lives in. And it's really, you know, nothing like obviously the Disney version, there's no singing table where, no. um, but the, the one thing that the one very Disney-esque point of this book is that neither Marie nor Sebastian have living mothers, yes. <laughs> which is very Disney. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. I, it's funny. Um, in my, one of my university classes for kids, lit, uh, kid lit and talking about fairy tales was, um, one point my instructor was making was that parents need to be out of the way in fairy tales or else their children will never get to experience these adventures. Like there'd be no reason if they had responsible adults in their lives for them to be doing a lot of the things that they're doing. And I think that's pretty key here too, is that Sebastian and Marie are both thrown in over their heads. They both have younger siblings to look after. And I think that's where they really bond too. And I, I wanted to that kind of reflection in them so that they both, I think they both understood at a really base level what the other was going through. And I, I think a lot of their relationship builds on, on that foundation. Absolutely. You, you've touched on this a little bit with your, with, you said your Wikipedia rabbit hole, but um, mm -hmm. then what, what other types of research did you do for the story? Yeah, so um, it does technically have a historical setting. So like I said, France um, in the early to mid 1700s. So I, I'm a huge history nerd. I love, you know, being able to research is like one of the, the bonuses of writing. And uh, so I did a fair amount of research in, into how they would live and what the homes would look like. Um, you know, I was still kind of going for that you know, broken down mansion aesthetic with Sebastian's house, but I wanted it to be, uh, you know, as realistic as possible as well. So yeah, lots of, lots of little historical things just to kind of make sure that um, I'm hoping that I represented life in the 1700s accurately. It's kind of fun because it, you do have a historical setting. It's, but it's not, it's not completely historical fiction because there is the supernatural element mm -hmm. to it. Um, so it's kind of fun that you can be historically accurate and then completely not historically accurate in terms of, <laughs> you know, the, the more supernatural elements of the story. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that for me, it's through all my writing at all age levels. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of basis in a historical setting, but magic thrown in, I always like to throw in my magic. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> When it comes to your characters, how much um, character development do you like to do before you start writing? And then how much actually happens as you're writing? How do the characters develop as you're writing? Yeah, I, I like to start out with some, you know, pretty decent character work. Um, my first thing is always finding out, you know, my character's misbelief and, and then their journey to their true belief. Uh, so that's something I, I always like to start with because I feel like it gives me like a spine or a framework for the story. Uh, and then I usually do some background into what were their childhoods like because I think that forms a lot of what the character is going to be like uh, at the time of the story. And um, but I'm one of those plotters that just always, always fails to stick to my <laughs> my outline. <laughs> And I think that's because I learn about a lot about the characters as I write as well. So I, I have this general idea, but uh, I can take a few chapters before I really get into the voice. And then I, you know, generally have to go back and kind of tweak and say, oh, that doesn't sound quite like that. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of a mix between like a plotter and a discovery writer. And I think a lot of that just has to do with getting to know the, the world and the characters and, 
And uh, you know, sometimes different ideas just pop up that, <laughs> that weren't in your beat sheet before. So. Oh, and I think there's probably a pretty healthy balance for, for anyone, any author, whether they say that, you know, they're, they're more of a plotter or uh, that they're not at all a plotter, but I think there's probably a mixture of both simply because as you're writing, if you're a plotter, as you say, things are going to come up and, and kind of change maybe a direction a character is going. Um, and so if you're not a little bit open to those types of things, um, you'd have a very different story. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think it's just part of the writing process. Mm -hmm. Have, um, did any of the characters in this book go in a direction that you absolutely didn't expect? Um, I don't think so. Anna came into my head really fully formed. And, um, so her personality, I don't think changed very much. I think Marie, I had to really consider, like I think my understanding of her morally greatness I suppose uh, grew as I wrote the book and and just trying to figure out what's her line in the sand like what is she you know willing to do and not willing to do and um, I mean the answer is pretty much she's willing to do anything but <laughs> trying to kind of reconcile that with a character that you know people would still be rooting for and so I think that took a little while for me to really get in step with her. It is time for our second break of the podcast. When we come back, Kyla will be talking a little bit about whether she might return to this particular world, whether as a sequel or a spinoff um, or you know, something along those lines. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with Kyla Pannon about her book, Stalking Shadows. Let's return to the interview. Is this a world that you would want to return to in a future book? I mean, it wraps up pretty well at the end, um, but there's also, if, you know, there's, I feel like there, it ends in such a way that there could be more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, there's no plans right now for a sequel. My next book is a standalone as well. But uh, I think I've left it somewhat open ended. I've had people tell me they really want to read more about Ori Lee, uh, the aunt. And um, I think there could be some fun exploration of her story in the same world. But, uh, you know, just like to leave open the possibilities, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, it wraps up, it, it wraps up satisfactorily, but there's the, that tiny little crack that maybe you could shove a door open. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, Marie's anxiety and that you kind of wrote some of yourself in that. Are there other autobiographical elements within your story or your characters? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that kind of happens most of the time because I, for me, I'm writing mostly from ex like my experiences, I guess, are rooted in a lot of my stories. So, um, you know, Emma's and Marie's experience with their dad is definitely something that I wrote from you know, a place of my own experience. And uh, just that, that sibling relationship, that really strong bond of, of kind of having grown up in turmoil and, and caring for a sibling definitely is something that I, kind of broke from my heart. So, yeah. 
Okay. But are any of your siblings werewolves? <laughs> <laughs> I know that's the important point. <laughs> are you in fact a werewolf? Kyla, would you like to tell us know. anything? <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep it a secret. Okay. okay. Oh, you're right. I, sh- I shouldn't have asked that. I shouldn't have put you on the spot like that. <laughs> um, uh, what draws you to this type of writing? It's both historical fiction, um, young adults, supernatural. It, it's kind of um, across genres a little bit, but what, what draws you mm-hmm. to maybe retelling fairy tales would be a better way to put it. Mm-hmm. I just, I've always been fascinated by fairy tales. My mom bought me a Hans Christian Andersen book when I was a kid. It was like an illustrated, I don't know, a collection of some of the stories. And I think that was the first time I was exposed to like real fairy tales or the, or the original fairy tales. Um, and I just like, I remember reading the, the story of the little mermaid and it was just devastating and heart wrenching, but also so compelling. And I've always been kind of interested in that darker view of fairy tale and the morals that they're, you know, putting forward in the lessons and, um, you know, whether right or wrong, I just find it as an interesting, uh, vehicle, I guess, for some of these, you know, uh, like little red riding hood, don't, you know, trust strangers in the woods and, you know, be protective of your virtue, which is not necessarily something I agree with, but I find it interesting that that's the vehicle um, that they used to get that across to their community at the time. And I think I just, I, I feel like there is so much imagination there and so many different ways that you can take it. And I like kind of looking at it again from our modern times, even though I'm studying them historically, but like what are kind of the messages that we can weave in for a modern audience and, and, you know, how can we look at them a little differently and challenge them in some ways um, and while still kind of respecting and honoring the original story. Mm -hmm. I think people who are only familiar with um, maybe some more modern tellings of the fairy tales are, often shocked when they read the originals uh, and find Mm -hmm. out kind of because I think all of them are dark none of them are really Mm -hmm. that whimsical Uh, no yeah I remember reading um the red shoes as a kid and just that traumatized Mm -hmm. me for a long time Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, yeah definitely and I like I think they were all mostly cautionary tales Um, mm -hmm. you know I read we have a book of fairy tales and I read my oldest son the little matchstick girl recently and he was just traumatized <laughs> like ah, he didn't want to read it ever again and I think it's because we just don't have a lot of um we're not exposed to sort of the the harsher realities a lot in our kind of western culture and, and I think it's um like you said it's just shocking but uh, I think there's just deeper messages there that are interesting. And like I said, I think it's interesting to challenge kind of what the the accepted um, status quo was a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. What are you working on now? Is it another fairy tale inspired or something different? So my second book that's coming out in August is uh, inspired by folklore. Uh, and then what I'm working on right now is what I'm hoping will be my third way. And it's inspired by folklore, but also uh, the Tudors, which are, have always been, the Tudor era has always been one of my favorite time periods. So I'm really excited about writing that one. And um, yeah, like I said, my, the book that's coming out soon, uh, Beguiled, um, taps into Scottish folklore and has an, an Edinburgh-inspired setting. So just just really indulging my love. My love of the UK and and fairy tales and uh, and folklore. Yeah, why not? I mean, if why not explore something that you're mm-hmm. interested in and, and and have a love for? I I don't blame you at all, mm-hmm. especially if it involves um, it, research trips to Scotland. I know. I wish they could. <laughs> it's kind of the wrong <laughs> time in the, in the world right now for research trips, but yeah, I'll have to set another book in Scotland in the future so I have an excuse to go there for a research trip. Absolutely. And then um, in terms of writing, have you always wanted to write? Is it uh, something you came to maybe later on in life? How did that uh, process work for you in terms of deciding to write for publication? 
I definitely always had an interest in writing. I remember like some of the first writing uh, assignments my teachers gave me in elementary school and just realizing that I really liked it. Like those creative writing when they would give you like a prompt and you would write a page or so. So I always really loved it. And in high school, uh, again, I was one of those people that was like, some of the half the class would be growing when we get a creative writing assignment and I was like yay, this is awesome uh, and in high school I started writing like short stories that were they were kind of like fables they wouldn't they would have never been published because they wouldn't fit into any real category but uh, I just kind of started experimenting with those and then I did a concentration in, in creative writing um, and an English degree in university so uh, you know the years of workshopping short stories and then, and then I kind of made writing into a career, but not fiction writing. I went into content writing and communications um, because, you know, you have to get paid. <laughs> and it's nice to have um, something stable like that. So I did that for a long time. And then I kind of, after I had my second son, I just realized it's like, nobody is going to write this book for you if that's what you really want to do. And so I just kind of, shifted from freelancing to uh, putting my time towards my extra time towards writing fiction and wrote my first MS like that. So I think, you know, I always had that dream of being an author and it just took a while for me to finally sit down in the chair and write the story. From your own experiences then, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I get asked sometimes like, how did you write a novel? And I wish there was a better answer, but it really is just sitting down and doing it. I think making the time for yourself is really important. Like I, previous to writing my first manuscript, I was doing some freelance on top of my um, kind of day job. And I just took that time instead of doing the freelance, I, I made it a priority to write. And I think it's really easy to push it aside and, and think of it as a hobby. But if you want it as a career, then you need to you know, carve out the time. And I, I know that's not easy for a lot of people when you day job or family you're supporting, but they're, that's really the only way to get the book done. So I think that's really important is just prioritizing your writing time and, and treating it as if it's a job. Um, but, and then on the other side of that coin, I don't think I'd be where I am without my writing friends that I made in the writing community. And um, so I think it's really important to kind of get involved with people who are at the stage you're at and who can, you know, support you and you can be cheerleaders for each other. And uh, you can give each other advice and talk through things. I think that's really important because this industry is full of lots of rejection and uh, it can be hard. So I think having a good support network is important too. Time for our last break of the podcast. When we come back, Kyla will be talking about what she likes to read. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Kyla Pannon. When you take the time to read for yourself, do you have go-to authors and genres that you like to turn to? Yeah, I I always really loved historical fiction, although um, I have been reading a lot more fantasy lately. Um, I also really love adult thrillers. I think <laughs> I try not to read too much in my genre when I'm drafting and I'm often drafting. 
but I, you know, I love lots of the books that have come out lately. Um, J. Alice Wings of Ebony, Lyndall Clipstone's Lake, Lake's Edge, um, Jessica Olson, Sing Me Forgotten. There's just, there's so many uh, great ones that I've definitely devoured in the last year or so. And, uh, but I, I do love, I love a British thriller. <laughs> it's just, um, I think that's like, it's like a palate cleanser for me when I'm, when I'm drafting and kind of into that fantasy world. So I kind of switch back and forth. I, I don't blame you for like, you know, like a good, uh, there's nothing wrong with being an Anglophile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about uh, any specific, like, do you have any favorite Canadian authors? Um, I, yeah, I know some great YA Canadian authors as well. Um, I, Ashley Shutterworth, Shuttleworth um, wrote A Dark and Hollow Star and that one's just, it's so good. And um, Liza Sambury also wrote uh, Blood Like Magic. Um, and that one's really, really great. So it's been fun connecting with some Canadian authors as well, uh, you know, because it's just a bit different from being in the States. And so hearing their experiences as a Canadian is, is neat and just lots of inspiration um, mm-hmm. because there's just so many talented, talented YA authors right there, right, out there right now. And this just stems from me being totally nosy, but I always, I just like to know what people love to read. And so how old are your, are your kids and what are they reading right now? Mm-hmm. So my kids are five and seven. My seven-year-old is, is, has just started reading independently and reading chapter books. And he is devouring the Firehawk series right now. I just have to go out and buy three more because he's just like working through them in a couple of nights. And it's just so cute to see because he's like staying up late with his reading lamp on to read them. So he's loving those. And he also really loves um, Star or Jedi Academy. It's like a Star Wars series. Uh, so he loves that. And then my five-year-old is, um, you know, just starting to learn to read. So we're still uh, definitely reading with him. And, and we've read a couple of books lately that have really resonated with him. Um, one is called The Invisible String. And I apologize for not knowing the author's name. Um, and then another one is about the, the making of a hug um, I think it's called the hop, the hug that got stuck. And I also unfortunately don't have the author's name at the at the top of my uh, head. But yeah, those ones are great. He really loves the. He's he's very like emotionally charged, and and so he loves those stories about like you know people people's love being with you all the time. I know you have a website, um, so if you can share your website as well as any social media that you are available on. Yeah, for sure. Um, my website is just uh, www.kylapannon.com. And so you will find some information about Stalking Shadows there. And um, I will be updating it soon with the guys' information. So you'll find that there as well. I'm mostly on TikTok. It's just at Kyla Pannon. Or sorry, no, that's wrong. I'm not mostly on TikTok. I'm very rarely on TikTok. Uh, it is at Kyla Pannon, but I'm mostly on Instagram. Um, which is the same handle. And that's kind of where I spend most of my time because I just, I find, I love visuals. So I find that app for the band really great. All right. Thank you for that. We have talked about a variety of different topics uh, during our time together, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like to bring up at this point in terms of um, this book, the next book, your writing process, anything at all? Yeah, I'll just give a a bit of a shout out for the paperback of Stalking Shadows. So the paperback, um, which I just saw the jacket for, and it's really exciting to see the the cover of my second book on there. So it comes out in August. And then my second book, Beguiled, uh, comes out August 23rd, and you can pre-order now. Actually, that reminds me that I did want to ask you about the cover art for Stalking Shadows for the, Mm -hmm. I have the hardcover. Um, Can Mm -hmm. you how much input did you have into it? It's, it's very beautiful. So can you talk a little bit about the cover art? Um, so the designer at Abrams Amulet, the, the design team is amazing. Like the cover for Beguiled is also gorgeous. Um, but this cover for Stalking Shadows was designed by Hannah Anouk Nakamura. And then the painting um, and the, the photography. So the, the girl behind is actually a photograph of them, but the Beast is a painting, and that was done by Juliana Kosova. And so my editor emailed me the concept um, 
ahead of time. And I was just like, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> like I love, love the concept. And then when she um, emailed me the, the first kind of draft, oh, it was just amazing. Like I was, I'm just was floored by Juliana's um, skill in the painting and how it came together. And it was just, just amazing. And then Hannah designed the hardcover as well. And it's just so perfect, like how they've stamped in the A and the M and uh, with the foil and everything. I just, it's so gorgeous. And she actually made the, the hardcover, uh, like the naked hardcover look a bit like leather. And then the first couple of pages kind of have that old world feel to the paper. So yeah, they just did an incredible job. I just finally took off my dust jacket. I, I normally I do, and this I hadn't mm-hmm. even. Wow! Oh, <laughs> so, yes, I know. Hey, I'm it's a little surprise. surprise underneath, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. My editor, she she emailed me kind of what it was going to look like in the design, but it when I saw it in real life, it's so striking. I was like, wow! <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, that was a, that was a fun little surprise. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And also, thank you um, so much for taking the time to talk to me about Stalking Shadows and a little bit about Beguiled. I really appreciate uh, the time you spent with me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I had fun. Thank you again to Kyla for joining me and uh, answering my many random questions, even the ones before and after the interview. I, you know, you, you think I'm nosy during an interview. You should hear me before and after when I have a, when I have other questions. Um, anyway, uh, thank you to Kyla for joining me. I really appreciate it. Again, the book is called Stalking Shadows. If you are a fan of re- the retelling of fairy tales or um, just, you know, historical fiction with a little bit of paranormal supernatural if you're a fan of the werewolf uh trope but kind of flipping that on the on its head where it's a female werewolf which you don't get as often then you should definitely check out stalking shadows and um follow kyla so you can see when her next books are coming out etc Thank you, as always, for joining me. Um, If you are a fan of this podcast, I'll say it once again. Please do like, subscribe, follow, do all those wonderful things. Um, Leave a review that really helps us to get this podcast out to more people. And if you're on social media, you can find the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And I would love to hear from you, hear what you're reading, hear what you, what's on your never ending TBR list, because of course we all have never ending TBR lists, right? Uh, That's, that's just the fun of being a reader is the list that will never ever get smaller because we keep adding to it. And I hope that you have found some books uh, from this podcast that you have added to that TBR list, um, some new authors from the ones that I have spoken with. I hope that you will join me for the next interview when I have returning guest, Christine Isley Farmer. Uh, You may remember her from last summer. She is the one that... um, uh, we were joined by my then 10-year-old niece, Risa, who has since turned 11, um, to talk about the first book in her children's series uh, about a dog named Boomer and her human. Um, and so we're going to talk about the second book in that series, A uh, Hard Nut to Crack. This one has mystery and intrigue and squirrels. So <laughs> join me for that interview on the next episode of the GSMC Book View podcast. In the meantime... I hope you're having a wonderful week, and as always, I hope that that week uh, affords you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.